Good morning. Good evening, ma'am. Good morning and good evening yeah, to me. <laughs> What's your question, love? How are you, ma'am? I'm good. How are you? I'm fine, ma'am. Hello, ma'am. My name is Sheikh Masood. I'm a ninth grader from the teacher Salwaram. My hobbies are playing games and playing chess. My future ambition is to become an aeronautical engineer. Can I share some information, ma'am? I want you to, and good luck on that. I can already see that you would make a fine aeronautical engineer. We need Thank you. Thank you. So, can I share your information, ma'am? Mm -hmm. Please do. Problem with the pre flight test mission, which launched in June with NASA astronaut Butch Wilmore and Sunita Williams on board, led NASA to conclude in July that the spacecraft would not be certified in time. In this connection, I would like to ask a question. Question, ma'am, can I? Absolutely. How does the delay in the Boeing Starliner affect the future crewed space missions? <clears throat> so, it's like you're talking about the Starliner that was not able to uh, kind of come back with those astronauts, correct? Yes, ma'am. So, here are some things that we need to think about. A- Boeing as a company has some real quality issues that they're going to have to address. Now, when uh, Butch and Sonny are there on the International Space Station, they were only supposed to be there, what, eight days? And then now all of a sudden it's eight months. Here is what is crazy to me is that I thought, well, okay, so they can't ride back on, and I get it, right? Nobody wanted a repeat of say a Challenger disaster and or a Columbia disaster. So they're like, hey, I haven't met an astronaut yet who wouldn't want um, to stay or be in space, right? So they were fine. They're like, uh, okay, it's it's not exactly what we were planning, but Sunni's now the uh, the commander of the International Space Station, they're able to participate in all of these things. But here's the problem. I didn't realize this. It's like they could perchance have come home on a previous uh, SpaceX mission, but guess what? There wasn't a space suit for Butch. So during that period from when they kind of like launched Starliner back by itself, gratefully it landed, people could, you know, kind of sit there and go, oh, they should have come back. But again, nobody knew if it would be safe or not. We're just not going to play around with human life. But Butch did not have a, a SpaceX space suit that he could wear. And you're like, well, he came up in a space suit. Why can't he wear that? Because there is no open source for those oxygen imports. So imagine this, you've got folks from all kinds of maybe different kinds of spacecraft or a company. You would think that we would design a spacesuit that would have, like if you're coming up from ISRO, if you're coming up from JAXA, like the Japan Space Agency, that it's like if you had a space spacesuit and something were to grow awry and you guys would need to all hop in the same spacecraft to come home that you could wear the spacesuit that you came up in and just have different adapters almost say like if you don't have a oh sorry my laundry just got finished um almost like uh, an adapter for your phone. You know, have sometimes you have an iPhone one, a USB C, a USB uh, uh, kind of B port for like a Samsung or an Android. So why aren't we thinking about like as we send things up, having them have some open source components that could plug and play if another disaster like this happened? And you know, I don't know that. I don't know Boeing's future going forward. It's been a legacy contract for years for NASA. One might say, why would you even go with them again because of all of the problems? It is to diversify the many companies that add to it. I think the commercial companies uh, like SpaceX and Blue Origins and others, but it really takes everyone. But that's one of the biggest kind of like issues, I think, and I would love for you to think about as an aeronautical engineer, is how can we make those things more open source so that those astronauts could have come home sooner? When there was only one spacecraft up there and there were, I guess, 
six or seven astronauts, if there had been danger and something had hit the International Space Station, do you know that Butch and Sonny would have had to have come back laying down underneath the seats with no astronaut suits on and hope that that depressurization, depressurization in the cabin didn't happen? I know. So many things to still solve. Thank you for a great question. Hi, doll. How are you? I'm fine. This is Punjita, a ninth grader from Chetpigaja Sidebaram. I would like to share a little information, ma'am. Please do. As a learning organization, NASA maintains lessons, learning systems to share stories gained through experience that can benefit the work of others. In this connection, I would like to ask you a question, ma'am. Can I ask, ma'am? Absolutely. My question is, what lessons can be learned from these missions to improve the reliability of future space missions? A oh, brilliant question. <clears throat> so, and, and one that I really love to answer is that so many of these things that we go, I think as humans go, but there's so many problems here on earth. Why are we worrying about what's happening this, there and everywhere? And like, why, why should we care about these NASA missions? But I will tell you that for every mission that NASA has sent, whether it was the Apollo kind of era things to the space shuttle, to the things that they're doing on the International Space Station, to the James Webb Space Telescope. I mean, that one alone is giving us, I mean, Hubble sent us these amazing images, Chandra X, I mean, all of these amazing things teach us more and more about uh, the universe and the and kind of like our place in it, right? So the more that we learn about out there, the more that we can appreciate our planet Earth, its position in the habitable zone of our star, the possibility for life. And here is a concept that I would love to share with you. It's called, like when we start to look for life whether it's on Mars and the many missions and rovers that have landed there. When we talk about searching for life on Mars, we're not just talking about life as we know it, but life as we don't know it. And we're talking about something called an agnostic biosignature, A-G-N-O-S-T-I-C, agnostic biosignature. And what we mean is, what kind of life might be out there that we have had no experience, no idea of. And so that to me even is also mind bending. Say for example, that very successful mission that NASA just had with OSIRIS-REx that landed on an asteroid during uh, like October, 2020, that we just got the sample returned from back last September. And now they're discovering as they're looking at the chemical makeup of that asteroid sample return, there's magnesium, there's calcium, there's copper, there's aluminum. So it just tells us that that we are essentially, even as humans, made of these same building blocks that are kind of like these chemical things that are out there. I mean, from the iron in our blood to the calcium in our teeth to the carbon in our DNA, we're made from these very same elements that exist in an asteroid. I mean, that's mind blowing. So I think when NASA tells the general public that here's what we're doing, here's the benefit, that the gift to us all is even in the James Webb Space Telescope as it's peering way, way far back there into the distant distant, distant past is it's telling us that there's still so much we don't know. I mean, they've discovered, the James Webb Space Telescope has discovered six, what they think are galaxies. They could also be black holes, but if they're galaxies that shouldn't exist, because they would come, they would have been already kind of well-formed about three or 400 million years into the process of the universe being born, being, being developed. And we just don't expect the universe to kind of like coalesce that quickly. And if that be true, if there were six galaxies that were already forming that soon into our 14.8, 14.9 billion year history as a universe, 
then maybe our cosmological systems are all wrong and we've got to rethink everything that we have known. So to me, the gift is the more we know about out there, the more we have an appreciation for what we have here on earth and the more questions there to unravel. Thank you for a brilliant question. Thank you, Hi, dear. How are you? I'm fine, ma'am. My name is Anusha. I am studying my test detection from the Technical School and Oren. Here, I would like to share you a little information. Oh, know. absolutely. SpaceX is the first private company to develop a liquid propellant rocket that has reached orbit several factors contributed to SpaceX's ability to undercut its competitors' launch presence. In this connection, I would like to ask you a question. Can I ask more? Absolutely. What role does the SpaceX crew main mission play in providing a backup seated option for the stranded astronauts? Oh, so without SpaceX, uh, you're exactly right. Those astronauts could be up there for a while. The thing is, in February of 2025, there are going to there's another mission that will go it will only carry two astronauts but think about this this is where we have to think about that uh we can even use newton's law here for every action there is an equal or opposing reaction there were there are two females that are not getting to get their chance in space that they were scheduled on to go in February 2025 on that SpaceX capsule because now Butch, Butch and Sonny need a return trip. So even Boeing's Starliner not being up to par is affecting two other lives who's who had had been kind of like they were on this calendar to fly to space. So imagine that's one thing. But SpaceX is it's also important to remember Elon Musk and SpaceX did not get there only by themselves. SpaceX is a kind of got many, many grants and partnerships with NASA. So NASA funded some of SpaceX earliest research because they knew they needed a commercial partner, another collaborator. And so what they're doing at SpaceX is nothing short of remarkable. Did you happen to see the other day where like, it's like it went up and then that actually kind of like, they call it the chopsticks, but one of those boosters came back and it captured it. I mean, what SpaceX is doing is it's, it's like, we're literally watching the future unfold. And because it's a commercial company, it can actually do things a lot faster and more quickly than sometimes governmental agencies that have to hire diversely across the country and use a multitude of corporations. But the gift of them is their innovative thinking. And thank goodness we have that partner. Now the Russians are still up there. And of course, relationships between the US and Russia are tense, but uh, there was care, there was a there was a lady that just came down with uh, the Roscosmos uh, astronauts. So there might have been a way that they would have been willing to partner and also get them home. But without SpaceX and their kind of like success with the Dragon capsule and their other things, uh, Butch and Sonny would, would be up at the International Space Station a lot longer. But uh, that'll be exciting to hear their stories once they get back on Earth to just kind of talk about how, what they missed. Cause think about it. If you're only going to plan to be up there eight days and then you're eight months, what weddings have you missed? What birthdays have you missed? Were there things on earth that happened that you couldn't get home for? So thank goodness for SpaceX. But I, I fully expect, here's what I think that you should be thinking about is that what if you develop your own company and start to think about how how your company could entirely run just rescue missions. If there end up being other space stations, like above space wants to build this kind of like space hotel and space research thing. What if you became the kind of like go-to space company that if anybody got stranded and their spacecraft didn't work, they're using your company. So I look forward to that. Thank you for a great question. What do you Hi. Mean? 
How are you, ma'am? I am great. How are you? I'm fine, ma'am. This is Subramanya Sushimas, a 90-day student from GPA School Aeronum. I want to share some information with you. Can I share, ma'am? Absolutely. From false alarms and dogging failures to debris collisions and module malfunctions, the ISS has faced a wide range of challenges that have tested the skills, knowledge, and resolve of its crew members and mission control teams. In this connection, I would like to ask a question. Can I ask, ma'am? Absolutely. How is NASA addressing the challenges of maintaining ISS operations with an extended crew rotation? Beautiful question. So again, one of the ways that they maintain those missions is that there are resupply missions when another SpaceX capsule comes in or another crew comes in. They're always doing some resupply. What I would love to connect your classroom with are some folks in mission control in Houston as well as in Huntsville, Alabama. So there's Houston, Texas, Huntsville, Alabama. So just remember that it's not like they are an island floating alone in space. There is constant contact. Those astronauts have to daily go through like a, a menu. The astronauts don't like it, but they have to go through visual uh, acuity tests every day. They have to kind of like check their biometrics, their heart rate, et cetera, their health. And so they're being constantly monitored. And so mission control plays an incredible part in this. They also, I know a guy in Huntsville, Alabama, that his sole job is to be, to know like the inventory of everything that is on the International Space Station, whether that's the seeds they are growing, the experiments they are doing, and even down to the food and the snacks that they have. And I don't know if you like chocolate. Do you like chocolate or any kind of sweet? Do you like chocolate? Okay, so it's like they. this guy even knows how much chocolate, peanut butter, um, marshmallow stuff to send up. So he's, he, there is a guy that is tasked with knowing exactly the inventory that is on the International Space Station down to their tools, et cetera, so that there's some, there's monitoring at all levels at all times. And again, they, it, I always go back. Have you ever watched, or I, I'm sure you're a know of Apollo 13, and it was what NASA called its successful failure. If you haven't watched the movie, it's, it's really pretty great. They, they make a few things Hollywood, but while they were trying to fix, figure out how they could get three people home in a spacecraft only meant for two, and it was kind of like trying to fit something square into a round hole, there were people on the ground literally running exercises, trying to figure out a solution while communicating with that spacecraft. So it's an incredible important kind of mechanism that 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 those folks, those astronauts on the International Space Station never feel alone. They are being monitored 24-7 uh, with every intention of making sure that everybody survives well. But maybe you'll be one of those people that come up with some mechanisms to make sure even how, you know, how to do that all even better. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, love. Good. Hi, how are you? This is Navesi and I am Kedar from Jatri Ethi Kalaram. Here I would like to share some information. Please, I want to hear. Mars is one of the few places in our solar system where life may have existed. And it is the most similar planet to Earth. Studying Mars can help us understanding if life is unique to Earth and how life may have evolved. In this connection, I would like to ask you a question now. Absolutely. The question is, can a human being ever make his way to Mars? If so, if it's so, when is possible? It was a little loud. Can you say that just a little more clearly there, your question? Because I think you're talking about life as we know it. Can you ask that one more time? Can a human being ever make his way to Mars? If so, when is possible? Wow. That's a great question. That is a great question. Can we 
as humans do that. I'm hoping, but again, lots of mechanisms have to be developed so that the human being can be safe out there. When we think about finally living on the moon and Mars, there's so many mechanisms for both those places on the moon is constantly being pelted by radiation and how do we live, work and do that sustainably. And do we want to like, my question is, I think it would be fun to go there or kind of like venture out to even further places in our solar system. People uh, say Titan, uh, the moon of Sa uh, Saturn would be a great place because it already has, it has like plenty of fuel and lakes of methane on it. I think the question is, we have to solve how does space radiation affect the human body? How does like the microgravity and constant pressure on the optic nerve? You know, I don't, or you may know uh, that one of the things that we consider is that in that very long, long trip to Mars, what happens in on the International Space Station for astronauts who stay there for almost a year, they come back dyslexic and their vision is impaired. Many astronauts, like eyesight gets impaired. So we have to think about how do we create mechanisms that make sure that the human systems are protected. So I'm not sure that I have a perfect answer to your question other than that we need to think about how we're going to create different ways that a human can withstand the rigors of living in space long-term, especially as it relates to radiation and how do we create a suit that keeps us safe from that? Do, what, do we, will we have to live underground at all times or most of all times on the moon or Mars to even be, be able to live there very long? So for your question, it's, it's profound but I think you might be the person to figure out that answer. And I see some people. I'm well, how are you? I'm fine, ma'am. My name is Sai Surya, a ninth grader from GPS School, Alavaram. I would like to share some information, can I say, ma'am? Absolutely. Astronauts face unique mental health challenges too, caused by the factors such as isolation, disrupted circadian rhythm, and the sheer pressure of their responsibilities. In this context, I would like to ask a question. Can I ask, ma'am? Absolutely. How does the extent of the stay impact the physical and mental health of astronauts on the ISS? Oh. I love this question, and it's one that comes up all the time when we talk about human space medicine. Here is something that they have found, my friend. If even in like long-term missions on the International Space Station and or long-term analog missions, for the astronauts to maintain their mental health, the ones who do it well are the ones who stay on task. They stay true to their exercise routine. They stay and do their kind of like, they go through their agenda for the day. They stay on task. It is only when they begin to skip something, especially this is what they found in like analog missions that they practice so that, you know, they kind of simulate missions to the moon or Mars. They have found that it's like, it's only when kind of like, they, a person is not following some kind of rigorous schedule that it's like it falls apart for them. If they start to sleep too much, if they start to skip kind of like their daily routine in any way. So there are some ways that NASA is considering how to effectively deal with these kind of issues of like, you know, I'm wondering now if Butch and Sonny, you know, those and again, I, I hate the term stranded in space as much as like they're getting an extended, you know, kind of experience in space, but I'm sure they miss home. And I'm sure if there is a, is a, is a wedding or something they were supposed to go to, they're having that sadness of not being with their families at this very special time. All astronauts know the risk uh, that are potential in any mission, but uh, NASA is actually now training and using 
virtual reality as a means to kind of like help with sort of some mental exhaustion, mental stimulation, and even mental relaxation. So it's imagine, it's like, oh, I want to imagine the beaches uh, and the ocean somewhere. Uh, they might put on their VR glasses and get that experience. So there are exper there are experimenting with ways to not only keep astronauts like on task, but also happy. They also kind of remember you can't be a person that just works all day. And if you got a chance to see, or if you haven't seen it, I'll encourage you to Google it, where astronaut Sarah Gillis played her violin in space with orchestras from around the world. So whether it's music, whether it's photography, whether there's some kind of play, an astronaut is gonna survive mentally better if they're adhering to their schedule, if they're keeping up with their exercise routine, if they're paying good attention to their nutrition, if they're making sure they have some time for self-care and they're making sure to communicate not only with their team, but with their loved ones back home. Not unlike how we, we survive best as humans here on earth, but a great question. If you're interested, look up, do a lot of research on human space medicine, there's fantastic things that they're discovering. Hi. Perfect. Mars has two moons. And they named the Pope and Diamond Mars can cook the stone, which lasts for months and can cover the entire planet. Area on Mars is 24.6 cover the entire planet. Area on Mars is 24.6 hours, not much longer than an Earth day. But year on Mars is 687 Earth days long. That's almost twice as long as an Earth day. Yeah. In this connection, I would like to ask a question. Absolutely. What are the latest advancements in mass learning technology? I'm what are the latest advancements in mass learning technology? So <clears throat> that is a brilliant question. Well, the latest kind of landing technology happened on the Perseverance rover. And they had what they called a range trigger mechanism where they could really hone in onto the exact place they wanted to land. They got so close using this uh, range trigger that they were, I think, within a couple of kilometers of their targeted landing site there at Jezero Crater. Again, they had cameras that were watching. So they were coming in and they have to monitor their trajectory so well because you're coming in hot and fast. Mars's atmosphere is very thin, so it does not give you the friction and heat the Earth's atmosphere does. So it's going to come in fast, 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 fast. As it's coming in, that heat shield falls away. The parachutes deploy. And then this range trigger was helping it find and map. And then they had retro propulsion that also fired as those kind of like parachutes are kind of beginning to like lower it down. Retro propulsion kicks up, pushes the spacecraft back up, and then gently, gently it lands on Mars. So that's probably the most advanced system that they've ever had and attempted on Mars. The problem here again is how do you like to carry humans? And we're talking perseverance, maybe weighs as much as a small SUV, like a sports utility vehicle, a little small van. But how do you, if you have humans on board, that spacecraft has got to be bigger. And it's, if you're going to like sustain them with food and water and oxygen and all the things that they would need to live as they land and do research on Mars, that's what we don't yet have. How do we take a much bigger spacecraft and kind of like come through that very thin atmosphere uh, of Mars going incredible speeds? Do we use those same kinds of parachutes? We Retro propulsion has been used for the Apollo astronaut lunar landers. Um, and they're, you know, again, it's a great mechanism. 
The problem is how do we get a very large spacecraft that could endure that kind of seven minutes or nine minutes of terror coming through the Martian atmosphere? So right now it's still parachutes and retro propulsion, but maybe in your lifetime, you'll come up with a way we get humans there safer and faster. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, Janet, Janet, thank you so much for your time. And uh, I must say that it may be around uh, 12 p.m. over there. Yeah, yeah, it's no problem. If you, I see so many students hanging around. Let's do this if they did not get to answer their question, because I talk a lot, but I want to explain. We could do something where for the next couple of Monday mornings, we could come back and, um, and I could do this every Sunday night for the next two Sunday nights, your Monday mornings. They get to ask more questions, and then I get to show them more about the Mars Innovation Challenge. Please, you guys, take a look at exploremars.org, and I want you forming some teams to, to participate in the Mars Innovation Challenge, okay? Thank you so much, Janet. And uh, before we wind up this session, we are going to sing our national anthem. <gasps> oh, I'm so, I'm so, I'm like so honored. I can't wait. Oh, wow. Bravo and beautiful. Namaste. That was so beautiful.